Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One very important idea in the social contract or contractarian theory of justice and by extension of ethics that Rawls is, is articulating in his work, A Theory of Justice, is what he terms reflective equilibrium. And this is a technical term that he's using to describe a process, you might say, if we want to be very metaphorical, by which we fine tune our moral judgments and thereby hopefully also our ethical or moral comportments, behaviors, motivations, and also uh, how we change things within society in a way that allows us a certain flexibility and open-endedness to moral development. So he brings it up first in uh, chapter four, very early on in the work, uh, saying that there's a state of affairs I refer to as reflective equilibrium. And what is this? So if we back up a little bit, he says, we, we look at the initial situation, which is, you know, making decisions about what kind of society we would, we would work out for ourselves and for others in a state of uh, ignorance of where our location in that society would be or what our, what our particular psychological proclivities, any of those sorts of things. And that then leads to, for rational beings, according to Rawls, several principles of justice, two main ones that are pretty broad in their, their extent. And they're, you know, prescriptive. They tell us uh, that we should have as much liberty as possible, compatible with the liberty of others. We should be equal in that respect. But we should also have inequalities when they work out to the advantage of all, not just the advantage of the largest number or aggregate as in utilitarianism, but they work out for everybody, including the, the people who are the most disadvantaged in society. So that's, you know, very good on a, a sort of high level of, of abstraction, but that doesn't tell us exactly what we ought to do in decision making in our ordinary day-to-day -day cases. And he says that, you know, when it comes to deciding precisely how authority and income or goods like that ought to be justly distributed, it's kind of tough to uh, decide, you know, in, in an abstract a priori manner. We have to work this out through uh, the application of the theory. So he says, in searching for the most favored description of this situation, the initial situation, we work from both ends. We begin by describing it so it represents generally shared, we, things we can all agree on, and preferably weak conditions. We then see if these conditions are strong enough to yield a significant set of principles. If not, we look for further premises. We have to add something to the mix, equally reasonable. But Rawls thinks that he's already got that. But if so, and these principles match our considered convictions of justice, then so far well and good. And then here's where the fly gets into the proverbial ointment. Presumably there will be discrepancies. Discrepancies of, of what sort? Well, people can't entirely agree, or we enact some policy, and then we see that there's some unintended consequences. So we are trying to make things more equal, and we created new forms of inequality. There's all sorts of things that can come up. So he says, then what do we do? We have uh, a choice. We can modify the account of the initial situation 
or we can revise our existing judgments. And judgments here we should take to be sort of our, our you know, core ideas about what's right and wrong, what's just and unjust, what what's, you know, ought to be done in this, this situation. He says we can uh, revise our judgments. For even the judgments we take provisionally as fixed points are liable to revision. And that's part of moral life if you consult your own experience. Rawls doesn't refer to that here, but you might want to think about that. Have you ever changed your mind about something that you held as very strongly, uh, you know, you have strong conviction, you think that you're being very objective, and then later on you're like, well, I was actually wrong about that. I need to change my judgment. The answer is probably yes, unless you were somehow incredibly lucky to have wound up with the, the perfect set of moral principles from the beginning, or you should have done it and you haven't done it. <laughs> so going on, he says... Um, going back and forth, sometimes altering the conditions of contractual circumstances and others withdrawing our judgments and conforming them to principle, I assume we will find a description of the initial situation that both expresses reasonable conditions and yields principles which match our considered judgments duly pruned and adjusted. This is what he calls reflective equilibrium. So reflective equilibrium is a state, an end position that you're getting to. It's also, you know, he talks about the process of reflective equilibrium. And what he means by that is how you're actually getting there. There's this back and forth process until the judgments and the principles coincide. And he, he also says, too, this is quite important, uh, that's why it's an equilibrium. We have a coincidence there, and it's reflective because we know to what principles our judgments conform and the premises of their derivation. We actually know what we're doing. It's not just gut feelings or responding to things on the spur of the moment. We've actually thought things out. We've talked things out. We've worked them through, you might say. Then he says, uh, at this moment, everything is order. But this equilibrium is not necessarily stable. He says it's liable to be upset by further examinations of the conditions which should be imposed on the contractual situation and by particular cases which may lead us to revise our judgment. How might that take place? Well, you know, we might have entered into the situation and made some, some big assumptions about what equality of, you know, these, these different liberties would actually look like. And maybe we didn't think it through sufficiently when it comes to people who are in disadvantaged situations that we don't really know that well because we're not experiencing that kind of disadvantage ourselves or we don't spend enough time with those who are and, and find out about it. You know, great example of this would be thinking about workplace issues and the, the entrance on mass of women into uh, certain types of workplaces where there were what we call glass ceilings and a lot of institutional bias. And, you know, it took a little while for us to realize that if you actually want to have workplace fairness, you probably need to have some flexibility in scheduling. Because Why? Because as it turns out empirically, uh, now it's changing a little bit, but it's still, you know, uh, tilted a little bit to, to one end for even for the younger generations here in America. Women spend more of the time doing caretaking, both of children and of other people than do men. So we'd have to include that into our figuring out, okay, what, what actually looks fair within the initial situation and what fits the principles of justice. And then we, we can hit a new reflective equilibrium. So what we end up doing is moving to one reflective equilibrium. And then we say, oh, this is, uh, this is good. But it turns out it's not completely stable. There's more and more discrepancy. And then we, we come to another one. So this is a continual progressive process for somebody like Rawls, which can lead to a lot of frustration on the part of people who want there to be a once and for all accreed upon stable equilibrium that nobody will ever question again. Wait a second, we gave you these rights. Can't you be content with those? Well, no, because we, we actually still need to keep working out what's just and fair by looking at how uh, the principles and our judgments actually do work out in the, the, the situations. 
So he, he says, I'm not going to work through this entire process, but we, we might want to think about this. Um, a little bit later on in chapter nine, some remarks about moral theory. After discussing, you know, what moral theory is, is about, he brings up again uh, reflective equilibrium. And he says the, the need for this idea arises as follows. According to the provisional aim of moral philosophy. What's the provisional aim of moral philosophy? He's, he's called it the attempt to describe our moral capacities. Our moral capacities are our abilities to make good judgments. Uh, he says, um, according to the provisional aim of moral philosophy, one might say that justice is fairness is the hypothesis that the principles which would be chosen in the original position are identical with those that match our, here's another technical term, considered judgments. And so these principles describe our sense of justice. Now, what is a considered judgment? He specified that in the paragraph just earlier. He says, they are those rendered under conditions favorable to the exercise of the sense of justice. Therefore, in circumstances where the more common excuses and ex explanations for making a mistake do not apply. The person has the ability, opportunity, and desire to reach a correct decision, or at least not the desire not to. What would be examples of things that would interfere with considered decisions? He gives you several of these. He says, we can discard judgments made with hesitation, or those in which we have little confidence, those which we give when we're upset or frightened, or those when we stand to gain one way or the other. So we, we need to be impartial, not moved by our emotions. I think we could also add to this too, judgments that are not being made under the duress of having to make a decision right now at this point in time. That, that's a common trick to, to make people make moral decisions under the stress of a very compressed time. So our, our, Considered judgments, he says, they are not perfect. And so we need to work out a reflective equilibrium. He says, um, we must make an allowance for the likelihood that considered judgments, even when we're not biased, we've got enough time, we've got access to information, we can still have certain irregularities and distortions, he says, despite the fact that they're rendered under favorable circumstances. So he says, when a person is presented with an intuitively appealing account of his sense of justice, he may well revise his judgments to conform to its principles, even though the fit, theory does not fit his existing judgments exactly. He's especially likely to do this if he can find an explanation for the deviations. And if the conception pr presented yields a judgment, which he finds he can now accept. So this is a process of, as I mentioned at the beginning, sort of fine tuning our moral judgments about what's right and wrong, about what people deserve, about what equality looks like, about what inequality looks like, what justifies adequately inequality by benefiting those who are worse off. So we, we do need to re-examine our consider judgments from time to time. And that means that we're getting a more and more robust conception of what the initial situation and what the principles of justice look like in the concrete. This is absolutely necessary for good practical decision-making and moral evaluation in real life situations if we wanted to put Rawls to use. There's one other thing that he says about reflective equilibrium in this chapter that I think is, is very helpful to keep in mind for the average reader. And, and here we can see that for Rawls, there is a difference between what we do in ordinary day-to-day decision-making on an ethical basis or, say, political decision-making and what we would do when we're doing political theory or engaging in ethics as, as a branch of philosophy. So he says that there is really two interpretations of reflective equilibrium. He says, it depends on whether we are to be presented with only those descriptions, descriptions of the initial situation and principles of justice, which more or less match our existing judgments, except for minor discrepancies. So we're looking at like, you know, how do we tweak it this way? How do we tweak it this way? We have a sort of narrowed realm of choice. Or whether one is to be presented with all possible descriptions to which one might plausibly conform one's judgments together, 
with all relevant philosophical arguments for them. So these are two very different kinds of operations here, right? One is much more limited, more restricted, and we do it all the time. The other is we pause and we say, okay, we, we got to like open up the discussion to all the possible ways of looking at it and the philosophical justifications for it. That is in fact what we do in moral philosophy uh, when we're doing it, you know, sort of professionally, you could say, or when we're doing it uh, in a adequate way, even as, as non-professionals. So he, he goes on and he says, in the first case, we're describing a person's sense of justice more or less as it is allowing for the smoothing out of certain irregularities, right? But in the second, he says, um, the equilibrium that we're aiming at, the reflective equilibrium, is the one concerned with in moral philosophy. Rawls is also rather realistic. He says, I don't know if we're going to reach this state in moral philosophy, but at least that's what we would be doing. So the two of them can inform each other, right? Um, we, can, we can use moral philosophy to, to push the envelope a little bit further, ethically speaking. But much of what we're doing when we're aiming at reflective equilibrium is not necessarily having to do philosophy at every single point. Otherwise, we wouldn't, we wouldn't actually get much accomplished. So that is what reflective equilibrium is and why it's important in Rawls's social contract ethics and theory of justice.